Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Give Me Back My Pro Wrestling, the podcast that's based on the old school, but can still help you find the good stuff from today. Dangerous Dan Colley, the Professor Jimmy Street, and the Plastic Sheik Jared are the undisputed six-man tag team champions of the wrestling podcast world. From thought-provoking topics to superstar interviews to action figure expertise, this trio does it all. And all they ask is, give me back my pro wrestling. Every other Thursday, wherever you listen to podcasts. Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of the Jackson Jackson Interaction Podcast. I'm your host, Gene Jackson, and this week I've got a special guest. I am joined by the one and only Mr. Steve Pleasing. Steve, how are you doing today? What's up, Jeannie? So it's weird. We have done quite a few podcasts together at this point, but it's always typically, you know, Whitey and Delbert or Buck and Delbert or, you know, all the cheap heat guys and you, but there's never been a one-on-one interview sit like sit down one-on-one interview with Gene Jackson and Steve pleasing with kind of casting the quote unquote characters aside. So uh, I thought that'd be an interesting conversation and maybe some people uh, would be uh, interested in hearing about, you know, some of the comedy people that watch this show will learn a little about who, who Delbert Jenkins is and uh, some of the people who are watching as a wrestling fan who are, uh, aware of Steve Pleasing may not be aware of Delbert Jenkins and what he's been doing in comedy. So we'll kind of bring both of those worlds together a little bit. How you feel about that? That's cool. Whatever you want to do, let's do it. All right. So <laughs> when did you, what year did you start wrestling? Man, I want to say like 2000. Maybe and how not, did you, how late did you 99. Get in? I got in from uh, Will Owens. Will Owens and Cecil, uh, please. And I went to high school with them. We had, uh, they were older than me. So they were, you know, a couple of grades older than me. I grew up in the same neighborhood as Will Owens. So I knew him from, you know, down the street and whatever. And I knew they were wrestling. And I, I actually, I wanted to, uh, I wanted to announce. I just wanted to try to get in and announce. And, uh, I was, I watched a few shows of, uh, Mickey's. And I think I had called. I I couldn't get in touch with Cecil or Will. I didn't know how to get in touch with them. And I called. Uh, I called Mickey and it arranged to uh, go up there or something. And just like a week or two before, I was leaving out and stopped in a store and run into Cecil. And I was like, "Hey, what's up? I'm thinking about going to Mickey's." And he was like, "No, no, 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 no. <laughs> come on, come, come over here with us." <laughs> yeah, I started. Uh, I got he got me in touch with Will, and Will was DJing and doing some other stuff around uh, the local scene here. And I got in with Will and come a slave to Will Owens and pumped his pumped his ring for many, many, many years. Yes, um, that's kind of how I come about the first note. I, I at first I didn't put together that. Steve that would come with Will and set rings up was Steve pleasing that I was seeing as the red superstars and all the different stuff. I, I, Cause you know, you look different when you get your hair pulled back and hat on and everything. I took me a little bit. And then when somebody pointed out like, no, you know who that is. I'm like, yeah, it's that guy that comes with Will. Like, no, he wrestles like wrestles. Like, yeah, he's in that tag team, big T. They're the superstars. I'm like, Oh, that's the same dude. Like he's got fucking pigtails. Like, yeah, he don't do that when he's setting the ring up. And I go, yeah, I guess that would be weird if he did <laughs> ring up with fucking pigtails and red singlet. But, um, so give me, I asked smooth this and he, he kind of ran it down a long time ago, but that's been a while. Kind of give us, you know, in, in wrestling, we've had the Dudley family, you know, we've had, a lot of legit families, but then, you know, I guess the pleasing seemed to me to most be along the lines of a Dudley clan. Kind of give me the history of the, the pleasings in Alabama wrestling lure. 
All right, this is the the linkage to the pleasings as I understand it. Okay. All right, so there's there's Mike pleasing, right, and then there was mm-hmm. BB pleasing, both that are come out of Boaz, Arab, uh, you know, Mickey Coleman. All right, That's and nice. then there, yeah, then there was Cecil pleasing, and then there was. Mm-hmm. There was a uh, me, and then smooth pleasing, and then somewhere <laughs> there's Octavia running around. Yeah, which I don't even know if she's uh if she's still taking bookings and stuff. I I don't know. I see her name pop up every now and again, uh, but not as much as not as much as you used to see. Um, so there was never really. I guess was there any kind of definition? I mean, like. Famously, the Andersons in wrestling, Arn and Ole Anderson. At different times, if you listen to the announcers, at different times they were brothers. Sometimes Arn was Ole's nephew. Some a couple times they called them cousins. So, was there ever any definitions of how the pleasings were related? Uh, I'm not exactly sure because you know I think. And I'm almost positive that Mike and Cecil were brothers. And then I remember being billed with Cecil as the pleasing brother. Okay. There we go. So that would make us all brothers. And then uh, I've tagged a couple times with Mike, with Panther, and he he would refer to me as nephew or or cousin. (laughs) And so I never knew. It just, I guess, however it comes out, that's what it, that's what it is yeah. right then. <laughs> it's Alabama roll tide. It, it'll it'll work. It, it's, it's all in the family, as they say. So they'll get it. <laughs> <laughs> they'll get it. <coughs> Killing so, the town um, anyway. It don't matter. <laughs> <laughs> were the were the nasty critters a part of that lineage? Were they was they somehow related to y'all or no? The nasty crit no, uh I don't know. <laughs> it, they could be. Maybe the, they're the pleasings from Central Alabama. Distant, <laughs> third, distant third cousins or some such. I mean it is Alabama, man. So um you get started and you become, you get drafted into the pleasing family. And, uh, I don't know who did you learn the most from starting out? Probably Cecil and Brad Robertson, who was TC carnage, who was a, he was younger than me. I had started a little bit late. I, I might've been like 22, 23. Cause I didn't know how to, I didn't know how to do it. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, uh, he was, I think he was like a senior in high school, real athletic. Could, he could go a little bit. And I remember Will would take your money and get you to set up his chairs and his ring and stuff. And uh, Cecil didn't tell me this till after it was over, but I, Will would take so much money from you. And then he would bring in Cecil, you know, and he would act mm-hmm. like it was, you know, now we're stepping our game up and we're going to bring in Cecil and he's more knowledgeable. And that's not at all. He was just ready for you to move on because he wasn't going to put you on his show. And so Cecil would come in and fuck you up a little bit. <clears throat> and then you, you'd quit showing up. And I think wow. there was like there was like six or eight of us maybe. And Cecil come in and started doing clotheslines and, and taking motherfuckers' heads off and shit. And, uh, you know, one by one, they'd fade out or they'd quit. And it ended up just being me and me and uh, TC Carnage, and I thought that's exactly that's how it was supposed to be. Like I thought that you know you were just out there fucking each other up. I remember I had my first match, and it wasn't me and TC Carnage. And uh, I remember like from the parking lot, mad calling Cecil and being like, "Hey man, this dude didn't hit me none. You've been beating <laughs> the shit out of me, bro." <laughs> I, you know, there's so many people that see or listen to this and you know take offense to that whole scenario there but i mean honestly people who's been in a while and who studied wrestling like that's how the business used to work for for better or worse right or wrong I'm not advocating it but the fact is the reason you couldn't hardly find a show that had matches like show stopping 
you didn't have, you know, a, a whole show full of stuck in a glitch type clips was because those guys got dealt with like that. You figure out who was who, you keep the ones you want, and then the others, yeah, they would just make life miserable for them until they fucking quit. I, was it that bad, really? Well, I mean, you know, because there's a lot of guys that are in rings every weekend now that shouldn't be there. No, nah, looking back on it now, I would. I wish everybody had had the same kind of training. And you see it when you get out on shows and shit. When I was serious, you know, and and really trying to give it a college try or whatever, you know what I'm saying? You would yeah. run into it, that motherfucker, because I wasn't you no know, fucking trained to the T or nothing, but I could do basic shit, and I could put on a fucking show and have a basic match where you know anybody, yeah. but then you get out there with motherfuckers that can't do schoolboys, and they're like, what the fuck? How did you get here, bro? <laughs> And it's and yeah, and it's worse now than than ever. Like, I don't know. I can't. I, I can't imagine. You see some of these guys, and that was another thing too. Though, like back in the day, they didn't put a lot of green guys together. You know, you wanted a green guy and there was a veteran who kind of lead the match. But like, I mean, some of the stuff I've seen on those shows is like if they were in there with a veteran and they 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 tried for a spot like that twice, they would have just beat the living hell out of them and then pin them. But instead of this, they just keep trying. Obviously, they're trying to do the same things over and over until they get it right. And they just never <laughs> end up getting it right. It just gets worse and worse and worse. But Bro, they would have fucked them up. Like, I remember I remember wrestling Cecil and him just, like, I'd forget the finish or I wouldn't. And I remember him just, I'd be like, hey, I forgot the finish. And he would just knock the fuck out of me. And I don't know how that works, but somehow I would re instantly remember the fucking finish and we would go into it. I'm like, I forgot yeah. everything. And he'd be like, and I'd be like, oh, it, shit, it, I remember everything. It, it clears the fog. All of a sudden, like, oh, there it is. Okay. <laughs> really lets you know where you're, where you're at. And I remember one time he had got us booked. He would get us booked in these different places and stuff. Because, you know, God just training with Will. I didn't know nothing about other shows and stuff. And he'd drive us out places. And I remember one time they started me as a Tokyo bullet. So I'm wearing a mask. I'm from Japan. I, I don't speak English. I'm just making up fucking noises. And, and I'm saying car companies. Toyota. Kawasaki. That's all I'm doing. Suzuki. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I remember we were, I wrestled him. I would, I, you know, we'd go to these shows and stuff. He'd take me to these shows and then I'd wrestle him. And, you know, he, he was the face. I was the fucking heel from, japan and 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 we would i was used to working with him so it wasn't nothing and i remember one night i would try to go out on my own i wanted to do some comedy or whatever and i would try to do a drop toe hold to him and i remember i hit the drop toe hold expecting him to you know sell it and go down yeah now now i'm shooting off the hill <laughs> and uh i remember him just looking at me like stop just dead stop and standing there looking at me and i remember just trying to you know i didn't know what to do so i start trying to really work the legs like i'm trying to work him over and i remember him just bending down and knocking the just slapping the fucking shit out of me <laughs> and i remember when the car ride home he was like what the fuck are you doing and i was like i you know i was trying to do something different i want to i kind of want to do some more comedy right so he was like you, you want to do comedy go to the fucking circuits he was like, we're fucking rice. <laughs> and I remember telling him, I, well, fuck, I think I know enough where I'll do what I want to do. And I remember we were on like 431 and he locked up this fucking Lincoln. Just dead stops. And I'm like, bro, we're in the fucking highway. And he's like, get out of the car. And I'm like, I don't want to get out of the car. <laughs> we, we don't have to do comedy wrestling anymore. <laughs> as serious as you want, sir. Yeah. <laughs> But I mean, that's he was dead ass serious. And when you got booked or a, a, a motherfucker but you, you're booked to do what the fuck he asked you to do. If you don't want to do it, take your ass home and go buy a ticket, go sit and fucking disparage the fucking show. You know what I'm saying? But you're there to do a job and to do what they need you to do to help their show or whatever the fuck. And my job was to keep my fucking mouth shut, and do what they asked me to do. That was all I needed to do. Yeah, I think that's something that's lost on a lot of people, like, that agree to a booking and they start working for a promoter and doing their show, but then they're always like, well, I want to do this, I want to do that, my character wouldn't do this, wouldn't do that, 
And then it's like, okay, well, they've got a spot for what they want done right here. They're putting up the money. They're putting on the show. So either do that or just don't do it anymore. But don't show up and bitch and piss and moan and make everything suck because you're not trying because you want to prove that what they're called isn't going to work. Or get the fuck out of the way so somebody that will do it can get in there and do it. I don't know. That's just my take. I think there's, it's a lot of fucking egos now in wrestling. Nobody's trying to put the show over. They're trying to put their goddamn self over. And I, I just think it's sad because it's, it's dying. It's really dying, bro. We're watching the fucking shit implode on itself. Well, it's like you said, it's, you know, it's like you said a minute ago. It's like, you know, your choice should be to, you know, do what you're, do what you're told, learn how to do it and get better. But like somebody realized a few years ago, oh, if I don't like what this promoter wants me to do, I can go and buy a wrestling ring. And wrestlers are so desperate to be on any show they can find. It's no problem for me to get a roster of 15, 20, 30 guys. So I'll just go start my own show. And then, I'll, and then I, can, I can be the champ. I can do whatever I want to do. And you have all these little shows that have popped up. And then those shows are bad. And, but somebody on that show felt like they weren't getting to do what they wanted to do. So then they went and started another show five miles down the road from that one. And man, it's we're seeing the result of it now because there's people who wrestled on nothing but shit shows for 10, 12 years. And now they're going out training people to be mm. worse than they are. And you know it's it's really starting to we're really starting to see the after are the are the nobody seminars. <laughs> yeah, anybody with a pulse can put on a fucking seminar now. Apparently, I don't know shit, and for only ten dollars, I can <laughs> to let you know how to not know shit. Or it's well, I've paid money to do a bunch of these seminars, so now if you'll pay me. I'll tell you the stuff that I half ass listen to in the seminars that I paid for, and you can get it, you know, second, third, fourth hand. There you and, go. Uh, it's sad because that, that, that show that, you know, we, we joke on it and clown it or whatever, but do you remember the first one we watched? They, that gym was kind of loaded, man. Yeah. They had, they had sold some fucking with, tickets. Uh, with Stefan Dunn. I was like, dude, you go back and watch that first one. I said, if you put a time lapse of like screenshots from the first one to the second one to the third one, I was like, you see the crowd just, it's like it was all shot in the same night as the crowd was leaving because it just goes down, 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 down. I was like, and how can it not? I was like, how can you pay money, even if you're only paying five bucks? Like, how could you pay money for a show and that be the show and then be expected to ever come back and sit there again? Because, like I said, even if they had one really good match on the show, if they had one match, it was just absolute great match. Name whoever your two favorite wrestlers are. If it was like Shawn Michaels and Bret Hart, you took them out of the show. Their their ability to shut off, the, you know, their disbelief is completely gone. Like by the time you've watched Bucky and Old Boy try to whip each other around six times, and you watch Red Solo Cup and Doink the Clown, it don't matter how great that fourth match is. You're 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 not getting into this shit. You just can't not happen i remember years ago seeing that oh boy he was refereeing and stuff and and i think i even said stuff to t about how it was like because he was a pretty good referee man i remember him being maybe he wasn't sure but i remember him uh, being he, pretty good because i remember saying something to my homeboy i was like god damn how good is it that you got a fucking referee that knows what the fuck no he's pretty, he is a pretty good case. referee but People always want to aspire to be more, you know, and he said that, I mean, he did this, this same podcast recently and I put the clip of it up there where he says on the podcast, he's like, I originally went into training to be, you know, you said you wanted to be an announcer and you ended up being a wrestler. Well, he went in wanting to be a wrestler and realizes a couple of, uh, a couple of days, weeks in, whatever it was that he wasn't cut out to be a wrestler. And he says on the podcast, like, I realized being a wrestler is not for everybody, and I realized it wasn't for me. I knew it then. I know it now. But at the same time, like, okay, if you knew it then and you know it now, why did you put yourself in the main events? Why did you put the title on yourself? And then he goes, well, it wasn't my idea. It was a promoter's idea. Well, you didn't have to go out and do it. You, sure you know, <laughs> I mean, you could have fought it. 
And I don't know. I just feel like you should play your fucking position, bro. I mean, playing my position has got me further than ever trying to politic or fucking what I'm on politic. Well, you know what I'm saying? Well, but the problem is like, so the promoter of that promotion is a, just some guy who kind of half ass got trained to wrestle. And I guess, I guess didn't have any success. I don't know. Cause I've never heard of the dude. He becomes a promoter. He don't know what position to put people in to play their position. He wouldn't know what he wouldn't know what they need to do in any position. So you got the blind leading the blind, and so hell, there's no how do you how do you say that? And then and if the guy doesn't think there's a problem, he's not going to listen to anybody that tries to help him. And go, hey man, because he he's unbooked a lot of people that were booked for that show that probably could have helped the show out and probably could have helped him out if he'd listened to him. And then he, he's canceled them off the show and doubled down on cornbreads and solo cups and those types. I don't know. At some point you just gotta, you, they, they, there's definitely too many cooks in the kitchen. You can tell that everybody's just out there doing their own goddamn thing, their own idea their own character progression in front of these people that could give two shits. They paid to see wrestling. That's what always killed me. Who cares about you? You can make up any storyline on any fucking night and make them buy it. If if they fucking invest in you, but that shit, I don't know. It's just throwing shit on the wall. And I don't think most of them, because you always hear, I mean, before I got into wrestling and understood what it meant, but you always heard the telling a story in the ring, telling a story. I don't think most people today even understands what that means. They think, well, we are telling a story. We're telling a story about how when I do this super kick and then another super kick and then another super kick and then the story of how I then dove out on the floor and then the story of, you know, he no sell that got up and then power bombed me on the side of the ring. Like, no, that's not a story. That's not... <sighs> No, it's not. I when me and T wrestled, I've seen it a bunch of fucking times, and people clowned us, and we were old school or whatever. But our claim to fame was the fucking with the people, man. If we could get the people invested, that's where it, it wasn't. Goddamn, no move we've ever did beat them calling me a crybaby or or fucking telling us we're fucking losers or you know what I'm saying when we would hug up or goddamn. It's just a lot of it don't make no sense. We would go out there and work a simple ass match and get a bigger response on a fucking hip toss than these guys going out there and killing their goddamn self. They're doing 900 fucking flips and that a whole routine, and these people could give two shits. They're on their phones. Well, I don't, what they don't understand is if, especially Southern wrestling fans, like, if I want to watch, I'm, if I'm a wrestling fan, I'm a fan of wrestling, and I'm a fan of the matches, I'm a fan of the moves, I can sit home, I can get Peacock and see everything that's happened in wrestling for the last 40 years, and then I can get on high spots and watch all the indie, PWG, all that, kind of, and I can watch all day long, and there's nothing I could see live that could be any better than any of the stuff I'm going to see for free on, at home on my TV. I go and pay my money on Friday night because I've had a bad week. I'm ready to just cut loose. And I want to yell at this douchebag with his hair and pigtails. He's cheating. He just, he just pulled the chain out of his tights and he thinks we don't know it. I'm there to yell at that guy. And that's the, that's where I have the fun. I mean, who cares about sitting there watching a bunch of moves that I can't, I can't interact. I can't participate. I'm just watching it. Just like I would watch a movie or I'd watch a concert. They come for that interaction. You know, they, they, they come to blow off steam and the people, like you said, if you are interacting with them, if you give them something to yell about, especially if you acknowledge their existence and, you know, have an interaction back and forth, they're going to want to come back to see you because they're going to come back and yell at your ass again. But if they came and they saw every possible move that you know how to do, why do they need to come back and see you? They've seen you do it. And them being there had no consequence. You didn't react to him. I yelled at that guy three or four times. He never looked at me. He never said a word. Why do I need to come back and see it again? Why do I need to pay money for that? That's I tried to make them make them give a shit about you. If they don't care, why do they get in? I, and I try to make them remember something. Them motherfuckers just watch nine hundred goddamn super kicks, but they'll remember the goddamn guy in pigtails crying on his partner's shoulder, or you know whatever the fuck dancing around. 
telling their grandmother to call him. <laughs> yeah. yeah, they're not going to be like, I remember super kick number seven from that one guy, the best. No, they're like, hey, I remember that guy that was, you know, he lost his match and he was, you know, having a hissy fit in the ring, screaming and crying. And then when I told him to shut up, he, you know, and I did a fat boy or whatever, you know. I just always try to have a fucking presence and, you know, but involve the fucking people. They want to be involved. These mother, I think that the dudes today, they put too much emphasis on their fucking monarchers and they're trying to say whatever they're trying to say. These people don't give a shit, bro. <laughs> well, I mean, and you, you know, and you've gotten a catchphrase over, like, it's funny to me, like, I don't think we've talked about this on the air, but you know, the night that you was in the Rocket City Rumble, we talked about, you know, the fact it came down to you and uh, Casio Kid's wife, Big Booty Judy, and she eliminated you and all that. Like, Conrad Thompson's big takeaway from that was like, oh, I love the Say My Name guy. So it's like, you know, it's not, oh, I like that guy that does that cool move. I like, you know, I mean, you're the Say My Name guy, you know? Like, you've made an impression with that. You, you, you are now... If you're trying to figure out somebody on the show, like, you know, he's that guy, he does that, you know, he does that <laughs> flip. You know, he, he does the flip and he's got the long hair and he's got the, you know, the kick pads. The guy with the kick pads, there's all of them's got kick pads. But if you go, you know, the guy that screams, say my name. Yes, I know exactly who the fuck that is. Fuck that guy, I hate him. Oh, was, uh, that like, was that was a good, some good shit. You know, I seen, I was watching, I had a show that night and was watching Breaking Bad. And it was the fucking episode where he does the whole say my name thing. Mm. And I remember <laughs> I was in the ring. Of course, I'm blown up and I'm, I can't think. And I'm tired. I want it to be over so I can go eat. <laughs> I ate all day because I didn't want to shit on myself. <laughs> and fucking all I could muster out was say my name. And I just started doing it over and over. And then I started doing it to the fucking crowd. And then I just started over fucking doing it to the point yeah. where I'd be like, say my name. And these people would be like, who the fuck are you? you yeah, know we don't I mean? know your name. <laughs> I don't even know you, bro. And I just, you know, it, it, and it was kind of like the Mike Jones approach. You remember Mike Jones mm-hmm. when he was famous? Was, oh, Mike Jones. <laughs> you, just, you just say it so much, it's relevant. <laughs> And I only know that guy because of that one thing. Like, I couldn't name you anything else he ever sang or anything else. But, like, if you mention the name Mike Jones, inevitably the person's going to go, Mike Jones. Like, they yeah. know exactly what that is, for better or worse. But, but and, and somebody, or I don't remember if it was NXT or, or ROH or something, there was a guy on TV that was doing the Say My Name shit. And I guarantee Velveteen you. A, Dream, the guy I, that ended up being alleged child molester and i guarantee you're a producer or something seen us doing something down here some old bullshit and he took that shit back with him will owens probably sold it to him he might have i've stole a (laughs) lot of shit from will owens poor will owens man i ripped off his whole gimmick (laughs) but i mean he trained me what are you gonna do i know (laughs) it's your birthright so we're not going to go down. We're not. This isn't one of those. This is your life interviews, where we're going to run down your whole career. Um, but I just want to kind of get a uh, baseline on how you got in and how you started out and everything. So, in uh, back in December on New Year's Eve, as a matter of fact, you did your first official comedy show. And yeah. as Delbert Jenkins, now you've been doing comedy podcasts. You've done quite a few stand-up shows. So having broken into wrestling and spent as many years as you have in wrestling and then seeing kind of how comedy works, how similar is independent wrestling and stand-up comedy? Like almost exactly. Only we don't, there's no punches. (laughs) It's without the bumps. Get out of bed the next day. It's exactly like wrestling. It's all a fucking work. Everything's, everything's, the more I learned about wrestling and now the older I get, the more everything in life is just like fucking wrestling, bro. Television. In comedy, everything's a work. Everything's political. Um, it's, it's, I, I was absolutely shocked how similar the two is, are. And, uh, I don't know. Like, I, I like, I like the, uh, you know, it's like wrestling. It gives me the same, I get the same high from that as I did, you know, from performing in wrestling, you know, doing comedy. 
It's like, hey, and I don't have to take the bumps and all the bullshit that comes along with, with wrestling. So it's, it's scratched that itch for me. And I have, for the first time, because I told a buddy of mine a few months ago, I was like, hey, yeah, I'm just getting completely out of wrestling and just doing strictly the comedy. And he like kind of rolled his eyes. And so he, we were talking about three weeks ago, and he's like, so are you back with the wrestling shit yet? I'm like, no, dude, I'm serious. I'm done with wrestling. I'm like, he's like, you know how many times you've told me this over the year? You know how many times you've been done with wrestling? I'm like, I know, but I said, I'm serious. Like, even in the past when I said I was done with wrestling, it was mostly just because of work schedules and other factors I didn't think I was going to have time for. It. I'm like, this is the first time that I genuinely – I have no desire to go when I hear about a show. I don't, Cause you still, I'd hear about a show like, man, I wish I could have did that show. Now I haven't heard anybody mention a show in a couple of years now where I went, man, I wish I could have done that. I'm just like, nah, nah, I'm cool. not doing that shit. And, uh, you know, you're juggling both. Uh, do they both kind of scratch the same itch or do you get a different feel for when you go out and do wrestling shows than when you go up and do stand up? I'm a, uh... I'm definitely feeling it a lot more on on uh, stand up. I've kind of, I don't know, man. I I love wrestling. I I love indie wrestling, garbage wrestling, shit shows. I I've always, man. You know what I'm saying? I mean, it, it. I I've always liked it, and I think I'll always care about it or whatever. You know, give it give a shit. But I don't know. I'm 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 just tired like from bell to bell i'm glad i was there i can't i can't go out and wrestle like i used to you know what i'm saying and i i, I want to yeah. give you your, your money's worth and if i can't go out there and, and do it you know i still want to be somehow associated with it i'm doing a little bit of managing and stuff and and the bell to bell when i'm out there i dig it but everything's changed so much and i don't know i kind of kind of feel a little phased out a little you know what i'm saying it, yeah it, it, it's hard to take a step back and take a, a supporting role you know what i mean it, but i don't uh <coughs> i don't know it's it's more of a hassle but when it's happening like i'm like oh i'm glad i did this but the getting there everything just seems like a hassle now yeah. more than it more than it used to a lot before I got to the point of, oh, I don't want to be here, it was if I could snap my fingers, be at the show, and it'd be time to go to the ring, come back through that curtain, snap my fingers, and be back at home, then I'd probably want to do it. It's all the in-between. It's not even a knock because, like, I mean, you know, we had fun traveling to the shows and stuff like that, but it's just like, all right, I, I'm, I, I work a half day on Saturday and my only day off Sunday. So when I leave work at noon, I got to scramble around, <laughs> go meet up with these guys, get in the car, travel off to where the fuck ever, do the show, leave the show, get home at two or three o'clock in the morning. So Saturday's just burnt. It's gone. It's all hard. I got it's is hard. Sunday to recover from all that. And when I think about the fact like, okay, I'm out there at the ring, whether I'm managing or whatever I'm doing, I'm out there for maybe a total of anywhere from six to 20 minutes, usually on the lower end, but even on the high end, 20 minutes. You talk about how many hours it, it usually took up to go to the show, be at the show, because, you know, you got to get there early as fuck and then leave. It's like I tied up 12 hours out of a day or more for – six to 20 minutes, six, to, rarely ever 20, six to 15 minutes a time. It's like sex. And when I was in my twenties, <laughs> yeah, no shit. Wait a minute, six to 15. What are you talking about? Um, so when I was in my twenties, I didn't really value my time that much. I didn't care, but the older I get, I value my time a little more. Plus I've got all these other things that I, I do now, all these podcasts, and bullshit and writing material for the comedy and all that. And I'm like, man, I can't go and burn 12 hours out of my weekend for this shit that I'm really not having that much fun doing. It's a lot. And I finally decided like, yeah, that's fuck it. That's got to go. And I, I'm, I'm like you, you said it a minute ago, like the last, I don't know how many shows I was at. I just would sit there and look around the room and listen to the guys calling matches spot for spot for spot. And I'm like, this shit's passed me by. Like, I sit here, I feel like fucking Cornette or something. Like, I want to fucking 
rant on these people, you know, and be like, no, you don't do it like that. Why, why would you do that? That makes no fucking sense. But yeah, I mean, and I then, never made it anywhere. I, I mean, never made it anywhere. So what do I know? You know, just you, shut my fucking mouth. Oh, yeah, exactly. I ain't never did shit either. But have you, like, I remember wrestling with Will or Cecil. You remember, you watched Will Owen shit. He's not back there calling you know what I'm saying? An yeah. encyclopedia. He didn't show up and hand you a sheet of shit he needs you to do. You might, you can talk to Will and he works off the hip and you can, and he's good. He can call shit. And I'm used to doing shit like that. When I have to remember nine million things in a fucking order, I don't, I mean, what the fuck did we come, you know what I'm saying? I mean, I understand the performance of it, but it, it just feels, I don't know, it's forced. I don't have no fun. It, it, it's more of a fucking hassle, but when I that New Year's Eve when I did stand up and you 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 were like, hey, I'm gonna do this or this, and you'll go up. It's like when you walked out and I was standing in that little area. There's a garbage can. I started, yeah, I got gaggy just like I did when I yeah. was goddamn 21, 22, and I'd been fucking get my brains beat out every goddamn two nights a week. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. In a fucking <clears throat> chicken house. So I could goddamn do this bullshit in front of 40 people. And uh, I was nervous. Goddamn felt like I was going to throw up and shit my pants at the same fucking time. And I, I don't know. It's like a drug. It does something to you. And when it really works, it, it's fucking magic. And when, <laughs> when it's really bad, it's fucking so horrible. You want to fucking jump off a goddamn building. <laughs> yeah. And that's another one of those cases, too, where the huge similarities with wrestling and comedy. Because we're like... When, when you're first starting out, you do have to kind of plan the match out a little bit because you don't know what the fuck you're doing. So you plan like, all right, we're going to do this, 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 and this. And then you go out there and you do those first one or two spots and the crowd ain't buying it. And so now you're just screwed because you don't know nothing else. So all you can do is forge ahead, do what you have planned, and it sucks and it's just terrible. It's the worst feeling in the world. Same with comedy. When you start out doing comedy, you have this set that you've made – You've got it. You've got it in that order. You've got it worded a certain way. And if you get to the second joke and they're not buying it, if you have nothing else, and all you can do is plow ahead and do that five, six, ten minutes and eat a bag of dicks the entire time and know it's not going to get any better. But if after you've done it a while and you've got an array of material and I start doing these couple of jokes, oh, they're not buying that. Well, let's try this. Then you start getting comfortable Then it starts getting easy. Same with wrestling. You're in the ring. You've done it a while. I'm like, all right. This seems like the kind of crowd. I remember when me and Will or me and whoever, you know, we did this and this and worked really well. So then you, he sees you going to do your your part of it. And he's like, oh, he's doing that spot. He's doing the thing we did in Scottsboro or whatever the fuck, you know. And it, and it comes together and it starts to work. And that's where the two, I think, are both very similar is – you can try to have an outline in your head of what you're doing, but if you go out there and it's not working, you, you've got to be able to switch gears. And until you learn how to, it's the most miserable feeling in the world being out there in front of everybody under those lights. And you know what you just said bombed. And you know, the next thing you're going to say is along those same lines. And it's probably going to eat shit just as bad, but you ain't got anything else. So you just got to do it. When it's two, terrible. there's, there's no, in wrestling, it, it might even be a little bit easier. And I don't mean easier as far as, you know, physicality or whatever, but mentally and and you know challenging or whatever it, it it might be fucking easier because you can shit on somebody else you got you got some shit to lean on that referee was fucking horrible this dude don't know what the fuck he's doing we'd have had a good match if so and so didn't do you know what i'm saying you can you can you can kind of lean on to where it fucked up but really in comedy i mean who are you gonna shit on like last night i ate dick bro it was fucking horrible, and I blame those people in that town. I mean, they were just a horrible fucking crowd. It, it wasn't a good crowd, <laughs> and a lot of it had to do with the uh, PA system, too. Like, people couldn't hear. Like, the jokes of yours they heard, they got some laughs, but then the PA's cutting in and out, and, and there's, you know... But there's nobody, there's no, you're at fault. You know what I'm saying? When you're oh, yeah. up there and it's your time to go and you can think of a million things when you're sitting out in your chair watching a motherfucker bomb, you can be like, oh, he should have did this or he should have did that. But I mean, it's, it's a, it's a sketchy fucking situation. It tests your goddamn, it fucks with your, your pride and your, 
the shit in your stomach. <laughs> you know what I mean? It, it does because when it goes well, it's an amazing feeling. You know, it, it really is. You're like, wow, I went out there and I made those people laugh. The stuff that I came up with worked. I was right. And there's no worse of a feeling when you go up there and people aren't laughing. They're just looking at you. Some of them look mad. Like, what? Yeah, why are you mad at me, why bro? Did you, why did you say that? You know, <laughs> like, it's terrible. It, man, I mean, I can't tell you how many times, especially starting out until I started trying to put some stuff together that works. But, like, you know, you get in the car, like, this ain't a job. Why am I doing this to myself? Like, I didn't have to come do this. I don't have to. I feel like garbage right now. Like, I want to die. Like, and I didn't have to feel this way. I could have stayed home and watched Tech at yeah, home. I had, I, to, I had to drive 200 miles to feel like shit. <laughs> and I got a 200 mile drive home to think about how hard I ate shit up there tonight. No, I drove all the way up here with hopes and aspirations. Now I got to drive 200 miles and think about what a piece of shit I am. <laughs> exactly. And imagining the people driving home from the show going, man, that fat guy was fucking terrible. Fucking like, guy with the ponytail is a fucking piece of shit. Had he ever even like been in front of people before? Like, yeah. did he know that Mike was on? So, because so and and I don't know. Last night it was just a, sometimes it's amazing. It's like all the right recipe. Like you got a little of this and some of that, and you sprinkle some of this shit, and it's all the right little little shits to make it fucking magical. <laughs> but last night, it, so it's a it it was a competition, and it it really felt like. The, the people that came with whoever they just wasn't gonna laugh at your shit. We're here for te- yeah, we're team, you know, we're team Roy, we're team West, we're team whoever, and uh, we're not we're not laughing at anybody else's shit because we don't want them to win. Which is and cool, I guess. That's part of the contest <laughs> element, you know. Uh, okay. In the end, as long as they bought their ticket, you know, from where I'm sitting, I'm happy. Um, but that's what it's that's kind of when it's kind of weird being on the show and producing the show because you kind of see oh, it from yeah. two different perspectives. Just like when you're the promoter of the wrestling show or you're just a wrestler on the show, you see it two very different ways. Hats off to the winner and all them boys because that shit was a little rough last night, son. It was. It, I knew <laughs> I knew when I went up and turned the mic on and said, hey, we're going to get started here in just a few minutes. I mean, usually, even at the comedy clubs, you know, you'll get some pretty good enthusiasm and people are just like, yeah, mm. Okay. It's like, oh boy. Oh boy. Glad, this is gonna I'm be tough. It, I'm glad it's over. So so I eat dick on the stage, right? And I go outside yeah. and then I, I fucking I'm getting ready to leave and I'm I trip and fall in the fucking wet ass rain drenched fucking parking lot. Yeah, so just a little bit of context for that. So this show was supposed to happen back in April at the rib shack in Amory and it was for Saturday, April, the whatever. But on Friday, the night before tornadoes come in and literally destroyed a good portion of Amory. I and mean, that was a sign from God. Nash- yeah. That we like, weren't supposed to go there. State of emergency shows canceled. The, the restaurant had been doing incredible business up to then. The, the comedy shows had mostly been selling out. And then I get told, hey, let's reschedule this for Memorial Day weekend. I was like, are people going to come do that on Memorial Day weekend? Most people have their own thing, you know. And so they pushed it back to June the 10th. And I didn't realize how bad things still were in Amory when they hit me up and said, let's do it. I go, okay, that's cool. And then, you know, back first of the week, I, I messaged the owner. I'm like, hey, man, how many tickets we got sold? He's like, we don't have any sold right now. I'm like, it's Monday. The show's Saturday. <laughs> He's like, there's been a few people say they're coming, but nobody's actually bought a ticket yet. And I was like, holy shit. Like, man, I don't know. And then I talked to some buddies I have that live over there, and they're like, man, like, a lot of these places still have tarps over them. There's businesses that aren't back open. There's people that yeah. can't get the insurance money to get their houses fixed. Like, it's bad over here. Well, we had we all had like little stars in our eyes. We were all excited, you know, for the trip and the experience, and 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 I was all like, you know, g'd up about it. And as I was pulling, you know, driving through the fucking town, I was like, oh yeah, these people are fucking devastated. It was, I mean, the damage looked fucking hard. Those poor fucking people, bro. Golly. 
It, yeah, it, it, it was bad. Um, you know, people seemed to have a good time, but, you know, it was just, like I said, it was a weird atmosphere. And, but, I, I, you know, everybody did, everybody did good. You know, I, I enjoyed myself. And speaking of comedy competitions, by the time this podcast comes out tomorrow, which will be Monday, we're doing this on a Sunday, um, the video will have come out on our YouTube channels of me describing uh, the main event comedy championship series that's fixed to start in Anniston uh, in August, where we're going to have a series of four of these contests, kind of like the ones we had last night. And uh, judges will pick a winner. The winner of each of those four contests, one in August, one in September, one in October, one in November, those four people will square off in December for the finals uh each one of those that wins each singular qualifying competition they win a hundred dollars cash and then they go to the finals in, the, in uh, december the winner of the finals in december gets two hundred dollars cash and the main event comedy championship belt so i mean it's pretty cool i mean how many comedy competitions winners has a freaking belt to show for it you know i mean uh it's gonna be a pretty fun concept uh, no, it's not an implication. The comedians aren't going to fight. It's not a fighting league. Um, it's going to be promoted in much the same way as MMA or professional wrestling. Uh, everybody that enters, I'm going to be getting you know information on them. We're going to be making little hype videos, promoting everybody. And uh, it's just going to be a different way to present comedy. And uh, I think it'll be fun. I think it'll be a good way to promote the club a good way to promote main event comedy but more importantly a good way to promote all the comedians that are going to be involved and so uh, i hope we're able to uh, get a lot of comedians on board um you know we've we've met some really cool people doing these shows steve in the last few months you know that's come and done shows with us and we'll probably do more in the future and there's quite a few of those guys that we've done shows with that i really hope come down and do these competitions because you know they're funny guys and you know, it's cool to hang around with, and uh, it'll make for good shows. For we, the, you know. we really got a cool thing going on up there in Aniston at the the happy hour. I hope it, I hope it, it rocks on. I'm, I'm excited about the the competition to see see what the fuck happens. I got a guy, man. I'm trying to talk into it. I think he'll be a real sleeper. Anybody that, you know, anybody that wants to enter, it's it's open to all experience levels. There's not an entry fee. Um, so, you know, if, if you got the courage to get up there, you're welcome to enter. And uh, even, I don't, I don't care who it is. Amateurs, you, anybody. Yeah, even if you don't, yeah, if, if, if you're an amateur, you've never done it before, you want to try it, you're more than welcome to try it. If you don't, if you don't like me. If you have, if you think I don't like you, it don't matter. I ain't got to, I ain't got to like anybody that goes on stage, and they don't have to like me. You're still more than welcome to participate. If you, if you and just want to come decided. up there, and, if you just want to come tell us what you think about us, you should enter. Yeah. You're probably not gonna make it past the first round, but yeah. no, I'm playing. But if you're funny, you're gonna win, bro. <laughs> that's where I was. That's where I was going. Is it's gonna be outside judges. There's gonna be a panel of judges brought in that are not tied to main event comedy not tied to any of the comics or even the club specifically and they're gonna they're gonna decide who wins their say is final so no one's gonna have it's you know no one's gonna have a leg up on anybody based on you know politics or friendships or any of that it's just gonna be they're gonna judge it from um stage presence quality of their material and the crowd reaction so you know, comedians need to uh, try to get as many of their friends and family and whoever there to support them. And that's just one element of uh, what the judges will be looking for. So I think it'll be a lot of fun. Like you said, we got a cool thing going over there. You know, we uh, talked about on the way there and back yesterday, we're still kind of kicking around the idea of maybe doing some uh, improv type stuff at some point, maybe some roast, a roast or roast battle type things. Just, you know, keeping things keeping things new and interesting and different. So uh, I'm pretty excited about the stuff we got going on over there. And I'm glad we've got a, a venue like that that lets us, you know, do shows and, um, and run them kind of, you know, the way we see fit to run them so far it's, it's working for us. Hell yeah. So look, 
like almost 10 minutes left. Let me tell you this story. All right. About the time Cecil wanted me to run blocker for him with this chick. So, you know, when you're young and your, your buddy would be on a chick or whatever, sometimes you'd have to run blocker and fuck with her ugly friend or whatever. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Well, there wasn't no real run blocker because both of these chicks were pretty rough. But we had wrestled, and Cecil was like, hey, I want you to go with me over to this fucking girl's house and yada, 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 and talk to this other girl while I try to, you know, smash this chick. And I'm like, all right, cool. And so <laughs> I agree to it. We get over there, and I'm drinking. You know, we're, we're I'm fucked up. I'm drinking the whole fucking time. We get over there at these girls' trailer. We're chilling and stuff. I'm drinking in true Coleman County fashion. As I'm at their trailer, <laughs> I learn that this is not two friends. One of them is a fucking mom, and one of them is a goddamn daughter, right? Oh. And Cecil's after the mom. So I'm, I'm sitting on this fucking love seat with the fucking daughter, right? We're making small talk. I'm fucking drinking. I'm fucked up. And uh, I'm so fucked up. In fact, I get to looking at the girl sitting next to me. And she's wearing those toe socks. You know the socks that look like gloves that chicks wear and they fill out their toes? All right. So I'm looking at them and I, I just keep, you know, I'm drawn to them. I'm staring at her fucking toe socks because I'm fucked up. So I'm, I'm thinking i'm fucking you know my vision's fucked up a little bit all right so you know you got a toe well where she only had four fucking things uh-huh. and i thought i was fucked up like i'm seeing it fucked up so finally i say something about it and i'm like look the fuck's going on with your with your, with your foot right there and she rips off her goddamn sock and she is like well i don't have a uh a fucking she's missing a toe right like some yeah. inbred ass fucking weird ass she's got this weird fucking and her, her toes are like oh no that's what it was two of them were webbed together that's what oh. the fuck it was two of them were webbed together so she had a special toe sock that they goddamn slid up in and i was like i'm sitting there and i'm drunk i'm wigging the fuck out right i'm like holy shit this bitch's feet are webbed and shit and she was like that's not nothing show him your feet mama and this bitch takes off her fucking sock, right? She's wearing her normal sock. So you never would have known this if yeah. they hadn't have pointed it out to me. <laughs> and uh, she whips out her fucking foot. Okay, where your pinky toe is. Yeah. All right. Like right here where I'm pointing on your pinky mm-hmm. toe. Her pinky toe is where her fucking long toe should be. And her long toe's on the end where her pinky toe should be. So in her foot, like the fourth toe is goddamn a pinky toe and then the last toe is long like a fucking long toe (laughs) and so i'm losing my goddamn mind right i'm tripping the fuck out and i'm like holy shit you guys are mutants and they got fucking very angry they asked us to leave their premises we were (laughs) asked to leave the dwelling and i remember cecil was mad as fucking me (laughs) on the way back and i remember he was like why do you always gotta open your fucking mouth and fuck everything up and i was like bro i probably just saved you (laughs) you were about to fuck you were gonna fuck a mutant bro (laughs) (laughs) they're not even x men they live in a trailer in common they don't even have powers they're just circus freaks (laughs) wow I mean, if you've got a messed up web toe, why would you wear toe socks? I mean, she go was, with the regular socks. That's... It was a toe sock. I swear to God, it had four toes on it. <laughs> because that's how it got started. Because I kept yeah. screaming her. I was like, what the fuck's going on with your toe sock? I was to the point where I was counting. I was like, one, two, three, four. <laughs> one, two, three, four. I was like, "There's, I'm missing something. What the fuck? <laughs> wow. But that's the time I... Got Cecil run out of a chick's house that was going to give him some pussy. Poor Cecil. We need to get Cecil on here one of these days. Does he know anything about podcasts? We should. I'm going to call him right after that. I just thought of that when you said that. He don't, but I mean, fuck, we'll 
I'll go get him and drive him here. <laughs> yeah, we'll get him on here one of these days before too long. But uh, Hell yes. He's got a lot right, of folks, stories. Check out uh, facebook.com slash main event comedy. Like our main event comedy page. Uh, you can go to the main event comedy.com. That's where you can find everything. Our Facebook, our Twitter, our Patreon, where you can see all the exclusive content, which is uh, full sets of uh, our stand-up shows. you got uh, watch-alongs of us doing uh, commentary on show-stopping wrestling shows, all kinds of great stuff on there. So check it out on Patreon and uh, follow all our social media stuff because, again, we've got the main event comedy championship coming up starting in August. So... uh, be watching for that video and if you want to give it a shot win a hundred bucks go on there click the link follow, sign up on the registration form there's a lot right. of information it asks for you don't have to fill out all of it and if some of it you don't have you don't have but the more of it you can fill out the better this we can better promote you and get your stuff out there for everybody as we promote the shows have you ever interviewed will owens i haven't um I've wanted to, but I haven't. I haven't been able to. You know, he just popped up on Facebook like a couple of years ago, and then he popped back off. Like you don't ever see him on there. Anymore. Yeah, he's very sneaky. He's elusive. <laughs> that's, how he stays, that's how he stays undefeated for years at a time, though. Yeah. I remember one of my one of my first matches. I was announcing. I was training with Cecil and Will, and it was Cecil and Will were gonna have a bull rope match, and they had this fucking bull rope, and it had a little cowbell in the middle. And Will was like, I'm going to take that cowbell off. And Cecil was like, why? And Will said, because you're going to hit me with that cowbell. And then the next was like eight, nine minutes of Cecil promising Will he would not hit him with this cowbell. He was like, I'm not going to hit you with a cowbell. I'm not a fucking animal. I'm not going to go out there. You think you're going to ring the bell? I'm going to hit you. You're my best friend. I'm not going to hit you with a fucking cowbell. And I remember they went out there to ride, so I announced them both to the ring. <laughs> bell rang, and Cecil doubled up the rope and hit him with the goddamn cowbell right out the gate. Hit him so hard with the cowbell, the cowbell came out, went out into the crowd. Good Lord. <laughs> it's the best shit i ever seen in my life. <laughs> Poor Will Owens. There it is right there. You can follow us on TikTok, Facebook, Twitter. Subscribe to the YouTube channel, please. YouTube.com at Main Event Comedy. So I think that's going to be it for this episode of the Jackson Interaction Podcast. I want to thank Steve Pleasing for coming on. And uh, anything else you want to say to your legions of fans before we wrap this up? Mm, If you're watching this, Will Owens, we miss you. (laughs) That's right. Come come check us out. Come see us at the, the happy hour, man. I'm coming. I'm this Friday at the happy hour. I'm opening for Bag Lady well, Sue. That's true. Uh, it's a good thing you. A good thing you mentioned that. that uh, I totally forgot to plug that here. Let me see if we can get producer Smokey on the case here to uh, pull up these flyers real quick. He's working on it. I see his little Paul's oh, yeah. there. Me and uh, it's me and Shane. Yeah, I don't have. Uh, he he can't find the flyers. But yes, on Friday night. You and Shane Knowles will be opening for Bag Lady Sue on Hell Saturday yeah. night. Me and Wes Sears will be opening for Bag Lady Sue. Oh, so yeah. Come one night, come both nights, but just come make sure you come, nights. as they say. It's going to be foolishness galore. You know it. All right, folks, we'll see you again real soon. And hey, make sure you check out the Drinking with the Jenkins podcast, which is going to be coming out uh, today, I believe. Sunday? I think it comes out on oh, Sunday. Yeah. Maybe it comes out on Monday. Yeah, it'll come out on Monday. So today, the uh, the main event comedy uh, video explaining the tournaments will be out today. Um, tomorrow, Drinking with the Jenkins with Whitey Jenkins and Delbert Jenkins will be out tomorrow. And then on Tuesday, this is out. So if you're seeing this, that means those other two are already out there. Go check them out. Uh, from what I understand from producer Smokey, the second episode of Drinking with the Jenkins got a lot of views a lot more than the first one uh, they're talking about in the third one that's coming out they're going to be talking about owf mud show mania and some of the wrestlers who are going to be participating so i can only imagine that's a wild one because they and find some crazy wrestlers and if you're listening to, to this later <laughs> just go to the comedy club any friday night 
they're there. Yeah, yeah they're there. Somebody's Flint, there. Flint's there. Flint will hang out with you. Uh, he'll hang. Have a few drinks with you. You can eat some chicken you, wings, and you can go on stage. Hell, you go on stage. Probably, you can do an hour. headline our show. You can do an hour on stage. You can do karaoke. <laughs> it's your world down there, buddy. So take advantage of it. All right, for for Steve pleasing, I'm Gene Jackson. Thanks for watching. <laughs>